this was for such an enlightening talk. Uh, you just delivered a very comprehensive perspective from these three continental philosophers. And for those who don't know, Professor Biswas is one of, if not the most prominent scholar in continental philosophy in India. So we're very lucky to have you tonight, sir. So uh, we're opening the question and answer session. Looks like we have the first question. Yes. Mr. Michael Nasial, yes. if you can hear me, can you uh, open your mic and deliver the question directly? Mr. Michael Nasial. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Michael, I can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. I'll just read out the question. Sure, what would be the difference between the easy and and the subject. If the subject for Badu emerges only due to fidelity to the event of the situation. If events are rare, so is the subject for Badu. If there are no subjects prior to the event of rapture, does it mean that all there remain are agents before any event? Fantastic question. What goes before the event then? Uh, that's something very, very interesting to ask. Uh, what goes before the event is an intervention before the subject comes into being. The very process of subject becoming into a subject itself is an intervention. And it is pre-evental in the form of being anonymous, you know, where it assumes the form of a void, you know, it's a kind of an anonymous intervention to bring the subject to the level of the event or uh, eventment of a subject as a subject. It's something anonymous at the level of, uh, at the level of pre-evental state. Now the state of the event, you know, which assumes a certain name or a certain cast in terms of a representation, in terms of a plan of action, or in terms of emerging into the meta structure that Bedu talks about, you know, uh, is not entirely something that is a fidelity. Fidelity, in a very narrow sense, would mean that the subject is bound to that kind of situation. It is rather a certain kind of forcing instead of just being fidelity to the event. It's forcing the subject to a situation. This act of forcing itself is an event which does not require the specific kind of subject language or which doesn't require a, a kind of fixed belonging of the subject in the situation. So therefore, fidelity in the sense of a force, in the sense of forcing in the event, which is like staging the event. And once the event is staged, the subject is again freed from subjectivity and the subject is also able to intervene in the event in order to change it to a certain function, as Bedou calls it. Now, now this is nothing but a generic procedure of intervention, Michael. So therefore, fidelity is not absolute here. Fidelity is the name for emergence of a subject in a situation which assumes the form of an event. But fidelity doesn't assume a meaning beyond when the subject tries to free, free itself from its own subjectivity. When the subject denudes itself, at that time there is no fidelity. Okay, Michael? So fi fidelity is overcome by the idea of a multiple, the subject itself becomes a multiple by overcoming its own fidelity to the event. Okay, Michael. Michael, can you hear me? Okay. Hello. Yes, yes sir. I was muted. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, Edward. Any other? question or anything okay so uh are there anyone who wants to follow it up with anything 
we have 30 people in the room. So uh, we have this question in the comment section, but uh, he wanted to be kept uh, anonymous. So uh, the question is uh, about the task of transcendental philosophy that you mentioned to enhance, uh, enhance us to tell the difference between reality and imaginary and even the interaction between the two. So how do you uh, read uh, this task of transcendental uh, philosophy uh, with regard of the, the, the idea of ideology from Slavoj Žižek as an illusion that hinders us from getting uh, into the reality? So, so uh, transcendence is produced in the form of an ideology. That's what Zizek would say. But Zizek will not subscribe to a notion of transcendence because for Zizek, uh, transcendence is uh, something that is an immanent transcendence. transcendence. Transcendence is not something transcendent transcendence. Transcendent is immanence for Zizek. So how could transcendence be immanence is an interesting question. Zizek would say that uh, uh, transcendence is uh, moving to another signifier. It's moving to another symbolic order. Now, how does one move to another symbolic order? It's a kind of a uh, negation of the negative. The negative that remains in a situation when the subject is not able to cross over, when the subject is not able to go to an exile, or the subject is not able to seek refuge, when the subject is disabled from changing its position, uh, is something negative. And this negative that is created in a situation within a symbolic order, which is pre-existing, and which gives rise to the identity of the subject in order to deny the capacity to transcend is something negative for it's a kind of a uh, it's a kind of a negation of the ability or the potentiality of the subject now a revolutionary subject has to break this uh, break this uh, bind or breaks this uh, stricture or break this restricted economy of a symbolic order. And the revolutionary subject can break it by disentangling the oppositions that are created within the structure of an ideology. The primary opposition that is created is between the fetish that the ideology produces, the fetish of power, authority, or the fetish of allegiance that an ideology produces has to be broken into a certain state of the world or a certain state of existence that would clearly mirror the opposition between the fetish and the object. So subject has to recover and recuperate the mirror stage, the original stage of subjectivity. Once the subject is able to recover the original stage of subjectivity from the chimera obscura. The subject is breaking the transcendental frame of an ideology in order to now move into the possibility of something that is differently ideological or something that is disideological, something that gives rise to a certain gap, a cashura, a caesura between the ideology and the experience between the ideology and the emerging forms of events, which the subject is able to reinterpret and is able to uh, give a different description. And this is how the binds of ideology can never, can never remain fixed, can never, never remain as a guardrail to predecide the movement of the subject. The subject is always able to find a way out. And that is the ticklish subject as Zizek calls it. So the ticklish subject is able to reestablish where it can see the possibility of transcendence in the form of overcoming 
a pre-existing religious, spiritual, moral, or an ideological order. So this is how we can look at it. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Biswas. Right. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Amfortas in my direct message. So this is, uh, maybe this is a, a little off topic. So he found out that at some point, uh, Slavoj Zizek has criticized uh, Baju. So it, at this point, uh, we should turn from Baju to Deleuze, to Deleuze per precise elaboration on repetition as the very form of the emergence of the new. Uh, of course, Bedu is to refine a thinker not to perceive the eventual dimension of repetition when in uh, Logics Desmondes, Desmondes, I'm sorry, he deploys the three subjective destinations of an event, uh, which are a fateful, reactive, and obscure. And then he adds a fourth note, uh, a fourth one, that is resurrection. So uh, how do we read this from the perspective of uh, Slavoj Zizek or maybe Edelus? Yeah, from the perspective of Slavoj Zizek, uh, this uh, possibility of uh, resurrection you know, is something that is also transformative. It transforms the grounds of subjectivity into uh, the possibility of uh, shaping the subject into a certain kind of being with an identity. Now, this being with an identity is sort of interpolated. It is individuated. But being with an identity is also a subscription to a larger, overdetermined uh, structure of ideology. So the subject can break this overdetermination by way of seeking, by way of getting out of it as a kind of a drive, a drive towards a new life or a drive towards a new place or any other kind of drive, maybe a sexual drive. But all these drives are not confined to the embodied form of subjectivity, but it is an externalized kind of a drive that Zizek emphasizes. Now, Badu will not call this interventionist mode of subversive subjectivity as guided by a drive, which uh, Zizek would call. But Zizek would say that without identifying the drive in the very subject, it's not possible to externalize the movement by the subject. So the movement, which is in the external world, has to be originating from a certain kind of a drive, which is a primordial, fundamental drive, without which the subject cannot make a step out of uh, its given subjectivity. So therefore, uh, Zizek uh, explicitly doesn't mention a theory of subject, although uh, there is uh, a subscription to the universal side of subjectivity, which is uh, irreducible, you know, except in the form of a manifest uh, politics, history, or society under particular circumstances. And in such circumstances, the universal negativity of the subject comes into picture because subject has to overcome the given circumstances. And that's a kind of universal uh, negativity, which uh, Zizek uh, points out in his flag of fantasies by saying that the negative power of disrupting is each particular situation or content uh, is something universal and it's also a violent effort of disengaging oneself from the particularity of the situation. So therefore subjectivity and universality are strictly correlative because this dimension of universality becomes for itself only through the individualist negation of the particular from which the subject's specific background arises. So therefore, Zizek's theory of subject is more dynamic than Bedou's notion of an intervention from within the metastructure. So therefore, Zizek would advocate a self-driven 
and auto effective and at the same time not formally positioned kind of a subject a non-positional kind of subjectivity a non-thetic subjectivity that can intervene into a situation so therefore Zizek opens up the possibility of a critique of subjectivity and these an embodiment by opening up the subject to something that is desubjectivated but at the same time not alienated uh, from the core of the subject because uh, that subject creates a certain drive in order to individually overcome uh, the negativity of a situation. So therefore, uh, Zizek makes a certain kind of adjustment, a certain kind of uh, micro level understanding of the movement of subjectivity instead of video <clears throat> kind of external intervention uh, from outside, which is uh, something like a Hegelian Aufhebung, which uh, Zizek doesn't admit in his scheme of thinking. So therefore, I think Zizek is more fine-brained here in developing the possibility of an ideology critic, which Bedou is not developing, and Bedou is rather confining the subject into a certain situation, into a certain fidelity. Of course, that is also overcomable, uh, even in the scheme of Bedou, but this overcoming doesn't result into creation of an alternative ideology. Uh, it doesn't result into creation of an alternative structure of power, which is there in Zizek. So therefore, Zizek is able to establish the sense of an alternative within the ideology critique by way of desubjectivation, but at the same time, not alienating the subject from his or her own subject. Okay. So that's how I do it. Yeah. All right. uh, thank you very much, Professor Viswas. We are moving to the next question from Mr. Martin about uh, continental philosophical interpretation of the present condition of India. Uh, Mr. Martin, are you uh, here with us? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, there are lots of interpretation uh, Martin is given from the continental uh, position. And one of the major interpretation is in terms of decolonizing you know, the canons of Indian philosophy. It's not just de-westernization, but it is also a certain kind of a decentering of the uh, of the pristine Vedantin dominant ideological figuration of uh, of uh, what is uh, an Indian identity or what is called Indian philosophy, and this will result into going down towards the uh, alternative forms of folk philosophization, alternative narratives about the systems and situation, which would historically connect itself to something that has been going on throughout the 18th century or 19th century, and which can finally result into a certain kind of a critiquing of the caste structure, a certain attempt to provide a place to the subaltern and the marginalized in terms of an alternative discourse. So, so it's possible, uh, multiple possibilities can be opened up and these possibilities would be something like uh, rewalding or reconfiguring the power relations or redefining the very sense of becoming. All this that continental philosophers have been talking about. And it is also a certain kind of deconstruction of the given framework in order to emerge into uh, rather a loose, non-essential framework about understanding one's own life world. So, so, so there are these multiple possibilities that could be explored in the Indian context. Although uh, not much of a work is done in the Indian context, maybe uh, at certain point of time, younger scholars in continental philosophy would be able to really uh, gather more strength to do that kind of a work, which is, uh, which is going to happen. Uh, in next uh, one decade or so. I, I am very, very hopeful about that kind of uh, perpetuation or circulation of uh, continental philosophical notions uh, in a comparatist perspective with the Indian philosophical notion in order to open up an alternative framework. So this is how I do that, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martin, do you want to follow that up with anything?
Okay, we have another anonymous uh, question. Yeah, why people are remaining anonymous? They don't yeah. <laughs> come into being. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. but yes, yes, please. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, would you say that the Bhakti movement provided an alternative discourse and reconfiguring of power relations? I mean, yes, yes. Uh, bhakti movements of certain kind, not bhakti movements of all kinds. Bhakti movements that dissolves the gap between the god and the devotee is something that creates an alternative possibility of transcendence where god is conceived as belonging to the devotee and devotee alone and devotee's world is inhabited by the god uh, so that the devotee can respond to the god and god can respond to the devotee the attraction the attraction between the god and the devotee actually goes into reshaping uh, various kinds of cultures for example uh, mohima cult in orissa where the absolute presence of the god is questioned and god is identified with uh, the animistic uh, kind of uh, uh, artifacts and uh, the natural surroundings where God won't have to assume a certain form and also God won't have to be formless as in the absolute context uh, but uh, God who is negotiating between form and formlessness depending on the way the devotees want to present uh, uh, the God uh, to themselves as well as to others and the challenge is to make them make my God into the God of the other how, how do I make my God acceptable to others? And, and how do I close the limits of uh, the, the symbolic, ritual, and, uh, and cultural practices uh, that can limit the, uh, the domain of a certain God or a domain of a system of faith to a certain community is also a, a certain kind of a creative process which has certain historical cultural closures. Now these closures that are created by limiting God to a certain tradition you know, has to be overcome by way of an inter-tradition, inter-cultural, inter-religious dialogue by, by exploring a certain sense of syncretism, uh, which is absolutely needed so that God is not confined only to a certain doctrine Okay, so this is one way of understanding the situation in India. And God, in case of India, is not doctrinal at all. God is not uh, someone who arises from the sacred text only, or revealed God. But God is something experiential. The, the phenomenological aspect of bhakti is to see the God, is to touch the God, and is also to be possessed by the God. So there are these practices by which we can move out of the doctrinia understanding of God and uh, a certain kind of theological or metaphysical subscription, uh, which seems to be uh, somewhat uh, part of a larger philosophical or religious doctrine, uh, is not absolutely essential to be followed in the form of a doctrine. So, so God could be doctrinia and also non-doctrinia. The non-doctrinia God seems to be emerging. Uh, as little gods and little faiths all across India in a kind of multi-religious, multi-spiritual kind of a context, which provides a scope of a lot of alternative spirituality, a lot of alternative textualization, a lot of alternative formalization in the form of music, in the form of performances, in the form of displaying faith by a variety of occasions and by a variety of uh, uh, cultural uh, kind of uh, practices. So therefore, uh, God is plural, this is uh, is no longer singular and, and no longer doctrinia alone. And that's the uh, most important realization about the God in the Indian context. Okay. Thank you, Professor Biswas. Uh, we have uh, two other questions. Uh, 
the first one is from Miss Anna. Can you yes. deliver the question directly, Miss Anna? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, sir. I want to know about the uh, capitalistic involvement in this religion uh, thing because nowadays what is happening, it is in front of us. So the capitalism has already captured the uh, real uh, religion thing. So I want to know how this involvement of capitalism has happened in uh, religion because it is spiritual thing and it is come out of our own self so as, as far as uh, Marxist theory is concerned. So how this capitalistic thing happened with the spiritual uh, being? Okay. okay. I mean, uh, capital, as you know, I mean, I will under, I will answer your question at three levels. Uh, number one is that, as you pointed out, that capitalists have appropriated religion. So the question is, how is religion and religious symbols appropriated by the capitalist uh, formation or capitalist structure of the society? That's one question. Uh, of course, I mean, capitalism needs a certain kind of a religious ideology, as Zizek would like to say. And this religious ideology produces a certain element for the capital, because capital uh, assumes an immaterial form of uh, a certain kind of an immaterial relation between uh, what is conceived as an authority and uh, those who subscribe to that authority. So, so capitalism all the time produces a small little structure of uh, an authority and devotee relationship. And in the process, it produces religious ideology or it accommodates certain religions in order to sustain that kind of a structure of authority. Now, this structure of authority is part of the larger political and cultural capital that capitalism builds up. Uh, and capitalism needs this capital in order to sort of create a captive, uh, a captive set of subscribers to its ideology. Now, it cannot directly do it only in terms of economic relations, but it can create a set of captive subscribers only if a certain form of religion is looked upon as an element that constitutes the capital or that constitutes capitalist production relations. Now, now, this is very ideological. It ideologically subsists the uh, people or the masses into a certain form of faith. And this is how capitalism appropriates religion. Now, the second important question that arises from what you have described is uh, why capital at all is successful or why capital at all is able to turn uh, the symbols of our ordinary life into a theological or into a religious or into a spiritual symbol. Now, spirit is without, spirit is not without a symbol. Spiritual is connected to a symbolic order. A symbolic order creates a sense of dominance by, by subjugating, by subjecting a set of subjects into, uh, into a kind of symbolic relationship with uh, certain images, with certain idols, or with certain kinds of uh, even doctrinal uh, statements. So, so it's a kind of a refined act of reproduction. It's an act of reproduction of uh, that which is held as belief in the form of a symbolic structure. And this symbolic structure is immaterial, intangible, and it performs the role of organizing its followers into camps, into groups and communities, such that these groups and communities now sociologically stand together as a kind of a social base for the capital to work. So that's a kind of a more uh, kind of a complicated answer from the point of view of capital turning our material world into symbolic. Now, is there a way out of it? Is there a way of emancipating ourselves from this kind of an ideological symbolic subjugation? And that was my 
whole uh, talk was all about that only. How do we uh, come out of this discursive uh, production of our subjectivity in the form of a religious dogma or an ideology? Uh, now, this is uh, simultaneously discursive as well as the discursivity of religion also encounters a certain kind of a void, a certain kind of a gap, uh, a certain kind of a mismatch with the real world. And this mismatch or void creates a space of an alternative thinking, of going back into a place of origin, which can give rise to a set of new truths, or also it can reconfigure or reconstruct the relationship between a certain faith in the world in, in quite new terms, which are not yet part of the discipline. So there are these possibilities that need to be explored in order to create a space for emancipation out of this ideological production of the symbolic order that we call as religion. Okay, Anna, this is how I'm looking. Anything else? Ms. Anna, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're moving to the next question by Mr. Jonathan K. Yes. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Mr. Jonathan K? All right, there we go. Hello. Hello. Sure. Thank you for a fantastic and super inspiring uh, talk. Um, I recently have been getting a little interested in Laurel specifically, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on his stranger subject, the, the disentangled subject that you were speaking of. Um, and, you know, Laurel himself speaking from a mystical or a, a Gnostic place, a lot of the times I have been wondering how we can productively put that into relationship with the mystical traditions in India. For instance, I've studied a little bit and uh, uh, of Sri Aurobindo as a, as a mystic, as a, a modern yogi in a sense. Um, and I guess a, a, a follow-up question would just be, how can we use that type of a posture, to use a Laurelian term, um, of a mystical imagination um, to, to try to conceive of some kind of a, a, a utopia or an ethical place in the, in the, you know, in the future? without getting into ideology, without getting into grounding it in an ideology? Yeah, I mean, this is the most German question that arises mm -hmm. from the kind of uh, Bedouian or Lerwellian position, especially Lerwell era, is advocating a certain uh, future, a future which is yet to arrive, you know, but a future which uh, can be indicated or intimated by our current acts of subversion. A future that emerges from uh, the subversive temporalities of the present and the past. Once temporalities of the present could be subverted by uh, non-conventional action, which are uh, creative forms of acts, uh, which also have a certain kind of mystic of exploring uh, something that is unknown and something that could be reinstituted, let's say, in the form of love, in the form of the sense of dying, in the form of uh, the unexperienceable experience of death, let's say, or an experience of sublimity of uh, a certain kind of relationship, you know, which is simultaneously individual, collective, and a kind of rhizomatic form of relationship, which opens up to a variety of dimensions, uh, dimensions of uh, communicating at various levels. So the subverted symbolic order actually gives rise to the possibility of communion, you can say, and that's something mystic that leads you to uh, a, a kind of a, a sense of transcendence, a sense of transcendence which is realized 
in certain formal ways, in certain ways of conceiving oneself, you know, uh, as, as a kind of a human in human, as, as Laruel would be talking about, in the place of human in person. So, so how can the human in person assume a place of human in human, in the form of a meta-human, in the form of uh, something called Zenos, you know, as Laruel refers to, Zeno, you know, or Zenos, who shot the arrow, the arrow of time, without, uh, without knowing where the arrow would struck, or without even calculating uh, how the arrow would go. So, so it's the experience of the incalculable, which becomes the most legitimate form of experiential aspect of one's lived reality as one goes towards a certain kind of transcendence. And that is something uh, is radically indifferent you know, to one's own very solipsistic experience. Uh, it's also a certain kind of difference. It's both indifference to oneself and also a difference with what one is experiencing at a certain moment. So this indifferent difference and this difference that is indifferent you know, that Laruel brings them together in the form of something that he calls a Zeno, borrowing from the idea of Zeno from the Greek uh, mythology, uh, who is uh, like a stranger to oneself with also a certain kind of an other when oneself becomes another in the form of thinking of transcendence, in the form of exploring a different possibility of experiencing something that is more sublime and something that opens up a new reality in a non-formal manner, as a kind of a manifold, as a kind of, uh, will call it, it's a kind of a philosophical machine, you know, that opens up, uh, which, uh, doesn't require a subject anymore, a, a philosophical machine without a subject. But that subject is someone like a Zeno. And therefore, uh, this kind of a subject is a perpetual stranger. And also this kind of a subject also is part of a an act of philosophization. And that act of philosophization turns the stranger into familiar and also familiar into stranger. It's a strange kind of a synthetic reciprocity between uh, knowing oneself and knowing oneself as a, as a stranger and, and turning away from being stranger to uh, someone who is known in a totally different manner. It's a, it's a new kind of self-discovery, you can say. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is something, uh, this actually shows men's place in the world. And this also ends a certain kind of a more meta political paradigm or cosmo cosmopolitical paradigm. It brings in a paradigm which opens up from the localized realization of the stranger self in oneself, localized realization of that which creates a set of asymmetric relationship with people around and then finally gives rise to a kind of uh, multiplicity and reciprocity together, which, uh, which doesn't require a transcendence in general, but it is engaged with a sense of being human. So this is this kind of transcendence that uh, that Lowell has talked about. So it has this mystical element of coming down from a certain sense of otherness, a certain experience of singularity or authority, which is uh, placed at a certain height, which is creating a space of relationship, a different ontology than the ontology of the usual existence, which Bedou, uh, which uh, Martin Buber would have talked about in terms of either way. Uh, that that there is a second personal uh, addressee or a partner who is no longer a stranger and there's a dialogue, 
between the stranger and me, and the space of the dialogue is the space of the being. Yeah. So, so that therefore, this mystical element is imbricated in this notion of immanent form of transcendence that Laruel is talking about, especially in his book called Cut of the Real, which is done with Katrina Kolozova and uh, Laruel himself, where he is discussing the nature of subjectivity and nature of stranger. So therefore, the human in human experience of humanity, you know, is one of a simple transcendence of an exteriority that does not transcend for the second time on the basis of a refolding replication over itself, which is given one time each time without being regiven, as Laruel states. I'm reading from Cut of the Lee. I think this would tell you what you were trying to ask me, probably in the form of a response. Mr. Jonathan, can you, do you have any response? Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful and very, uh, such musical thought. Uh, I hear this all as, as music, being a musician myself. Um, it's full of possibility. Uh, and yeah, that is a fantastic book that I still have to get to reading all of. But that's, thank you for uh, pointing to that. I think, I think it's a great, great example. And I guess just quickly then, um, sure. It seems as though this type of a different ontology it could, would you say there's a relation to certain mystical utterances from the Indian traditions? Like, is it, is it, is Laura really pointing towards a, a consciousness that is beyond the confines of the rationality in a, in a, that's what he's doing, but is it, is it relatable to, to certain types of uh, experiences in the past um, in the Indian tradition? Absolutely, spot yeah. on. Because Great. there is this uh, translinguistic thing, hmm. kind of uh, uh, idea of indiscernible, thing, as we call in the Indian tradition. Uh, this indiscernible again is imminent in our ordinary layer of experience. What we experience is only a part of the reality, which has to be probably. Uh, uh, subsumed under you know, a certain uh, larger reality, you know, which will require a kind of an upward ascendant movement in the form of transforming the consciousness of the self into consciousness of reality. And therefore, it will be uh, a selfless awareness of the emerging forms of reality about which one is just aware of and which will be uh, without uh, any process of thinking, unmediated access to a kind of ocean of consciousness, which is also a kind of reality, within which there is this particular possibility of understanding uh, how a certain sense of spirituality or a certain sense of ethicality or a certain sense of a kind of political understanding of the world re-emerges from that kind of open awareness of the world, which is spiritual and political. For example, in the Indian tradition, uh, the tribal uh, leaders, Sidhu and Kanu in Jharkhand, when they fought against the uh, British masters, they said that they were possessed by a certain superordinary power in order to fight back uh, the British armed British military. Uh, with only stones and arrows, but with tremendous, you know, flow of spirituality that they experienced in the form of, uh, in the form of foregrounding uh, a dream about uh, liberating themselves from the yoke of colonial rule. So, so you can see the uh, political, ethical, and spiritual juxtaposed in this open invitation to awareness about a larger reality, which is emerging from a subject, but crossing out the subject and going beyond the being that a subject is used for itself. So this move in Indian philosophy is one of the most fundamental books, which is sometimes embodied, sometimes disembodied, and sometimes it's a journey towards 
a kind of a conception of ultimate reality, which is the ultimate soul of the universe or the creation, which is not available in our, our ordinary life in a Devoharic sense, but is available in a phenomenological sense. It's available in a sense of uh, liberating ourselves from our body and from our mind and from our current situation. You know? So that's a fundamental move within Indian philosophy, which conceives of a mystical capacity to be realized in the form of an everyday move in our own consciousness. You know? Yes. Okay. So, uh... We are moving to the next question. Sure. Perhaps it's the last one before we close this meeting. So the question is from Mr. Flat. Can you unmute yourself, Mr. Flat? Oh, okay. He can't uh, unmute himself. So I'm going to read this for you. Sure. The question is, why does Larwell want to replace philosophy with some kind of ecology? How would someone like Baju or Zizek, on the contrary, insist on philosophy's importance, especially today? Yes. I mean, um, the, the whole idea of ecology, you know, uh, is an idea of uh, uh, life itself. Because life, the act of living, and also creating a sense of being a subject within life, you know, uh, is simultaneously a sense of being sacred as well as a sense of being profane. You know? The profane life and the sacred death, or the profane death and the sacred life, you know? they are sort of spatially separated or temporally separated in the idea of life. You know? And this life is something that embraces embraces uh, something that is zoontic, something that is connected to other species, other living creatures. And in that connection, it overcomes the boundaries of speciesism. Now, overcoming the boundaries of speciesism is to see oneself as part of a larger, harmonized Gaia or an ecosystem, as you, as you must be hearing about it. And it's a kind of a deep ecology that binds together a number of species and it creates a kind of shared life, a shared life that, uh, that connects certain bodily functions and mental functions with a totally different set of bodily and mental functions. So, so it's a kind of a functional relationship which creates a certain sense of balance and closure. And it produces a certain demand for living together, uh, not at the cost of each other, but by seeking one's own resources from the other. And at the same time, by giving one's own resources to the other. So seeking, soliciting, giving, and then sharing in the, in the space of a common kind of a rubric, uh, while having different forms of life, growing together simultaneously, uh, is a certain kind of a vision of an ecosystem that, uh, you know, Larwell in his last book about ecosystem and humanity has talked about, that without such an ecosystem which creates a certain sense of uh, repetitive, recursive, and reproductive uh, uh, form of existence, which uh, redraws the balance between uh, the ecosystem, the living species, and the human being. You know, uh, is something that is most warranted as the form of transcendence, which is experienceable in this world. And this is what Darwell is talking about. And I think your question is taking you to that direction. And therefore, ecosystem assumes the status of a living creature itself. We are no longer an isolated species living within an ecosystem, but the whole ecosystem is a living creature on whom my life depends directly. Uh, until and unless we arrive at that kind of a uh, mutually 
collaborative recognition of each other's existence, however small or big it is, we will be able to uh, establish our claims to survive in a situation where there's a huge change and disruption that is, uh, that is taking away the life-sustaining elements quickly from our hands. So it's a question of saving those life-sustaining elements by bringing together the forms of life that are around and by re-establishing a certain kind of harmony, reciprocity, and mutual interdependence that Larue talks about. Okay, uh, I guess we're running out of time. So <laughs> if there's any, oh, we get a message. It was such an insightful and comprehensive talk. Thanks to Professor Biswas and Marxism discussion group from Stephen Rolt. Okay, uh, we are more than grateful to have you tonight, Professor Biswas. Thank you for your availability. To, to lead our discussion uh, throughout this uh, wide sweep of continental philosophy. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we have uh, positive feedbacks already. Uh, and we are looking forward for the next session with you, if you yeah, are willing yeah. to. Yes, that is. Uh, everyone, if, if you are interested, uh, in 2017, Professor Biswas wrote a book entitled Between Philosophy and Anthropology. A four years of thought, language, and consciousness. Uh, you can find it on Amazon if you are interested in the trajectory of his research. So, um, once again, thank you everyone for joining it. Please keep in touch with, with our representative. Our discussion group is open for everyone to join. Uh, we are going to talk to uh, Professor Biswas for the possibility of making another discussion to dive even deeper into his uh, trajectory of research. Uh, do you have any uh, concluding remarks, Professor Viswas? Yes, I'm so very thankful, grateful, and also at the same time, uh, such a joyous feeling of talking to all of you, Edward, and Heber, by chance I met all of you, and it's a great gift meeting all of you. It's a, it's a gift of philosophy, I must say. And also, it's a gift of Marxism that uh, we are able to discuss things in a much more, in a very novel way, in a more experimental way, in a more creative way. And the space is uh, so gifted, I must say. And I thank you all very much. Maybe uh, sometime in October, November, we can plan for another, if you want. And then we'll talk about it later. Thank you all, and especially to my students and friends who have taken time out along with everyone. I thank them also profusely, along with uh, Edward Heber and his entire group. My uh, heartfelt thanks to all of them. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Professor Viswas and everyone who attends this meeting. We are going to inform you about our next meeting. Thank you for joining in. We are ending the meeting. Good night. <laughs>